I am very excited to have Joshua Whitehead here tonight to present our annual Andrew Mogulski lecture. And before we begin, I have just a few notes for our time together. We kindly ask that everyone remain muted for the duration of the event to avoid any interruptions to the lecture. In the unfortunate event that we're joined by a bad faith participant, myself and my team member, Laura O'Brien, will do our best to quickly mute and remove the participant. We appreciate your patience and support. In case you're unfamiliar with the League, which I don't imagine is the case, but still, we are a national organization that supports poets and poetry in Canada through awards, microgrants, and programming like National Poetry Month, which seeks to place poems in the hands of new readers. We are extremely grateful to the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Toronto Arts Council for their ongoing support of our organization, which allows us to organize and deliver amazing programming like tonight's lecture. I personally am joining you today from Kitchener, which is located in Haldimand Tract, a 950,000 acre stretch of land belonging to the Six Nations of the Grand River and the Mississaugas of the, New, of the Credit before them. The Six Nations of the Grand River are currently in litigation against the Crowns of Canada and Ontario, to account for the 95% of land lost to the Haudenosaunee people since the Haldimand Treaty in 1784. You can find more information about the work of Six Nations at sixnations.ca. And now I am very thrilled to introduce our lecturer for the evening. Joshua Whitehead, who uses he and him pronouns, is a spirit Oji Nehio member of Pegwis First Nation, Treaty One. He is currently an assistant professor at the University of Calgary, where he is housed in the Departments of English and International Indigenous Studies, Treaty 7. He is the author of Full Metal and Digiqueer in Talon Books 2017, which was shortlisted for the inaugural Indigenous Voices Award and the Stephen G. Stephenson Award for Poetry. He is also the author of Johnny Appleseed from Arsenal Pulp Press in 2018, which was long listed for the Giller Prize, shortlisted for the Indigenous Voices Award the Governor's General, Governor General's Literary Award, the Amazon Canada First Novel Award, the Carol Shields Winnipeg Book Award, and won the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Fiction, the George Bounier Award for Fiction, and Canada Reads 2021. It was a hit. Whitehead is the editor of Love After the End, an anthology of two-spirit and indigiqueer speculative fiction, which won the Lambda Award in 2021. Whitehead's latest book, Making Love with the Land, was published in 2022 with Knopf Canada, exploring the intersections of indigeneity, queerness, and most prominently, mental health through a Nehio lens. The book was shortlisted for the Hillary Weston Writers Trust Award for nonfiction. You can also find his work published widely in such venues as Prairie Fire, CB2, Event, Arc Poetry Magazine, The Fiddlehead, Grain, CNQ, Write, and Run Rising Magazine. I know it's terrible having someone read your bio, but after all of that, please welcome with me, Joshua Whitehead. <laughs> um, yeah, there we go. Hi, folks. Um, thank you for joining me on a Friday evening, as it is 8 p.m. there in Eastern Time, 6 p.m. here uh, in Mountain Time, where I am in Calgary, also known as Mokinstis in the Treaty 7 Territory and the Blackfoot Confederacy. Thank you so much for you know, coming to the reschedule. I was just so horrendously sick. Like, I don't know, I think I was just channeling Halloween because I definitely sounded scary. Um, so thanks for joining me here in 2.0. Uh, so there's a lot to get through today. So I'm kind of just going to jump in, but I hope you have your pens and paper ready because there's going to be an onslaught uh, of book recommendations for you. <laughs> So uh, on this Friday night, let's get a little wild with literature, shall we? So I'm just going to share my screen here so you can see. Uh, okay, now I have a million keyboards. But yes, welcome. Um, so my talk today is entitled on paranoid and reparative reading. So we're going to be jumping through a lot of hoops lately. So I've tried to include everything um, that is at least that I'm quoting from on here so that you can follow along. Uh, and I will move to the slides as we get into the next bit of information. So I'm just going to jump in. Uh, oops, there's too many keyboards here. There we go. Um, in the dedication to her seminal memoir, Half Breed, Maria Campbell gives thanks to Stan Daniels for, quote, making her angry enough to write it. In the opening pages of her memoir, 
Campbell orates that a close friend of her said, Maria, make it a happy book. It couldn't have been so bad. We know we are guilty, so don't be too harsh. Campbell responds, I am not bitter. I have passed that stage. I only want to say, this is what it was like. This is what it's still like. I know that poverty is not ours alone. Your people have it too. But in those earlier days, you at least had dreams you had a tomorrow. Published in 1973, it goes without saying that Campbell and Halfbreed are one of the most foundational pieces of Indigenous literature alongside the works of Lee Miracle, Thompson Highway, Gregory Schofield, Beth Brandt, Basil Johnston, Daniel David Moses, Beatrice Moisener, uh, Minnie Ayla Friedman, and Ruby Slipperjack, among so many others. Prior, we of course had we had published indigenous storytellers such as uh, Dagen Wage, also known as Pauline Johnson, but it wasn't until the 1970s and 80s that we began to see a blooming field of multiple published indigenous literatures. So these writers that you see here paved the way for how and what we know as the textures of indigenous literatures today, popularizing and voicing concerns of Indigenous peoples living, having survived, and continuing in the wake of residential schools and state-sanctioned cultural and actual genocides. So we have Thunder Through My Veins, In Search of April Rain Tree, Life Among the Kaluna, Kiss of the Fur Queen, Indian School Days, and Bobby Lee Indian Rebel, to name just a few. Because of the fierce literary accomplishments of this wave of indigenous writers, we, such as myself, who work in this current literary wave, a third wave perhaps, often now called the indigenous renaissance, which is also contested by us as a form of erasure of those prior, can freely reposition form, we can freely reposition genre and subjecthood in our writings, or so we at least try to. It would be inappropriate to say that this previous wave of indigenous literatures was bound to genre and or form, with the rise of memoir, autobiography, biography, and nonfiction being prominent among them. It's also important to remember how Halfbury by Maria Campbell was originally forced to censor scenes of rape at the hands of RCMP, and which was just re-released in 2019 with that edition and is a hybrid of fiction and nonfiction, perhaps one of the beginning texts of what we now call autofiction uh, in the 1970s, as it was coined by Serge Dobrovsky in 1977. And as Indigenous literatures are wont to do, they are what we might call experimental, only because Indigenous literatures are, in and of themselves, transgressive and inescapable from our epistemologies or our worldviews. Indigenous literatures are all genre and no genre simultaneously. They are temporally against settler ideologies of linear time, uh, what we call, quote unquote, Indian time or indigenous time uh, to always being late to our own becomings. So if you're ever late uh, with an indigenous person, they say they're running on Indian time, uh, late to the bingo. That's why we're a little late to the becoming. <laughs> These books are fantastic and literal and are outlaws to parochial made forms of literature. And how I've come to read them, as Campbell and Kin discuss in the opening of Halfbreed, is as a literature of anger, righteous and rightfully so. So I am an incredibly paranoid person. If you were to ask my parents what I gravitated towards as a child, they would be sure to tell you Josh loved Doom. I had a deep reverence for the Terminator series, especially the film Terminator 2, which these scenes are from, Judgment Day. I would watch this film on repeat, and there is something that spoke and continues to speak deeply to me in watching Sarah Connor, played by here Linda Hamilton, become a final girl and take on the shape-shifting, indestructible, liquid metal, amorphous T-1000, played by Robert Patrick, who relentlessly hunts her and her son, John Connor, throughout the film. Sent back in time to kill her son, John Connor, who would later go on to become the leader of a human resistance against an AI-ran world, omnipresently by Skynet, the T-1000, or the Terminator, was to me both the embodiment of state power as he hunted down a fostered John Connor, 
and the embodiment of carceral systems as Sarah Connor is chased throughout a psychiatric hospital for her efforts to prevent a prophesized judgment day. And as I watched Sarah Connor burn to bone and dust in the blast wave of a nuclear bomb, holding frantically onto a chain link fence and trying to warn unsuspecting children, she melts into nothingness. Sarah Connor is paranoia embodiment, and I, a paranoid child, loved her. Nowadays, at age 34, I am frantically paranoid about nuclear war, with the rising tensions with Russia, with India, with China, the occupation of Palestine, with the unearthing of indigenous children from former residential schools in Canada and America, to the ongoing pandemic and the fear, real and imagined, I embody during the two-year lockdown, to the one million marches and incredibly anti-indigenous, I think here of the cherry picking of residential schools as a conservative ideology to combat what is perceived as the quote, indoctrination um, of gender and critical race theory in publication. An irony that is not lost on me as an indigenous person indoctrinated with settler ideologies of gender and sex and sexuality. To more personal, but by no means smaller issues regarding mental health and body dysmorphia. I wrestle with my body on the daily, mentally, physically, and spiritually, due in part to my own embodied fat phobia and also gaining 50 pounds during the pandemic. I cannot express the absolute paranoia and anxiety I manifest when I am perceived by others, especially those I know who knew me prior to my weight gain. I continually feel so cheated out of a body in life. I also have and am combating ideologies of consumption, penultimate coping mechanisms as a paranoid person that were incredibly heightened because of the pandemic, consumptions of food, nicotine, and alcohol. I am paranoid of the harm I know myself capable of doing. I am paranoid of the harm I know others capable of inflicting on me. I am paranoid of the whim I am positioned upon as a two-spirit person in a climate of continuing colonization. I exist in a wasteland too. Etymologically, paranoia comes from the Greek meaning alongside, beyond, altered, irregular, abnormal, contrary. It emerges in the Latin para and nu meaning demented of the mind. It is defined as the mental disorder characterized by systematized delusions of more or less definite scope in 1848, as delusions of persecution or grandeur, usually without hallucinations, and as a mental derangement, madness in characterizing mental illness, particularly towards women. I don't use this linguistic play to rationalize my paranoic tendencies, and learned habitual practices around consumption. Believe me, those are not paranoid fantasies, but ongoing unlearning I am continuing to do. But rather, I find joy in the deployment of the abnormal, in the beyond, in the ill long side, in the workings of the contrary in this definition. I think what a wonderfully queer sentiment. What an embodied term for being a colonized subject, paranoia. What a delightful methodology of activated state-sanctioned forms of resisting recognition. Because, of, of course, I slash we are paranoid peoples when disempowerment and disjunction are formulations of being that we have normalized, that we have embodied and indoctrinated within ourselves. How could I not be paranoid of a state that can actively kill, murder, and or disappear me? How can I not be paranoid of the self-consuming habits of queer life and queer cultures? How can I not be paranoid of my eating disorders and body dysmorphia, which prime me for self-destruction? How can I not be paranoid of how those, these ideologies inform and enhance me? If I am a paranoid person who paranoically can disengage, or sorry, can engage destruction, literal and literary, then I too wonder what a paranoid form of writing might look like. And if there is such a form of writing, what are its contours? What are its allowances? What are the disadvantages of writing as a paranoid person?
And are these ethical forms of engaging the paranoid for literary and literal emancipations? How and do I emerge creatively and stylistically as one who inherits a paranoid history of indigenous writing, as in the poetics of confession, testimony, witnessing, and transgression? I turn to the late Eve Kozofsky Sedgwick, who is an American, or sorry, who was an American academic scholar of gender, queer theory, and critical race. One of her most prominently well-known books, Touching Feeling, is a wondrous dive into the realm of affect theory, or the study of emotions, on queer lives, literatures, and reading practices, among other necessary criticisms that Sedgwick has given us. It's here she pens her most popular essay, quote, Paranoid Reading and Reparative Reading, or, and this is the subtitle, You're So Paranoid You Probably Think This Essay Is About You which parodies, Car uh, parodies Carly Simon's You're So Vain. Sedgwick, speaking with her activist scholar friend, Cindy Patton, during the first decade of the AIDS pan epidemic, inquired about the then ongoing theories regarding the emergence of HIV and AIDS, and if it was deliberately engineered and or spread, if it was a plot by the US military, if people in power disregarded likelihoods of global environment and population changes, et cetera. Sound familiar? It most definitely should. Patton then announced, supposing we were ever so sure of all these things, what would we know then that we don't already know? Patton's comment here to Sedgwick suggested that for someone to have an unmystified, angry view of large and genuinely systemic oppressions does not intrinsically or necessarily enjoin that person to any specific train of epistemological or narrative consequence. The response beckons Sedgwick to ponder, well then what does knowledge do? The pursuit of it, the having and exposing of it, the receiving again of knowledge of what one already knows, how, in short, is knowledge performative? And how does one move among its causes and effects? With these inquiries in mind, Sedgwick posits us towards paranoia and repair. Uh, quoting Paul Rousseau, a French philosopher best known for his work regarding what he calls hermeneutic phenomenology, Sedgwick calls paranoia a facet of the hermeneutics of suspicion or the codes of suspicion which denotes that, quote, the man of suspicion carries out the falsification of the man of guile. This she calls paranoid reading, which is widely understood as a mandatory injunction rather than a possibility among other possibilities. Or to put it another way, we are fundamentally trained socially and culturally as modern enlightened subjects to move, think, and read the world suspiciously as paranoid philanthropists. This, I think, is a call that many of us are taught to heed as writers, as academics, etc., to scrutinize and find the hole in which we must fill ourselves within, albeit again as academics, critics, etc that we must always locate where it is our field has failed and place ourselves into it. This I formulate as a form of literary and theoretic colonization. Now I'm not saying that each arena of knowledge of writing has become fully enfleshed so as not to need our stories or our criticisms, but rather that we can move through reading as a disruptive guest, primarily to black, indigenous, queer, trans, or literatures of women so as to rupture membrane and replicate ourselves into where we are not needed. And this makes us poor writers, poor readers. We insert ourselves into places not our own, places that seek to harm us and are spaces that no longer require us for the promise of publication, acclaim, accolade and or recognition. It's hard not to hear the Indigenous activist John Trudell warning us to protect our spirits because you are in a place where spirits get eaten in this merging. I did this with my first book, Full Metal Indigiqueer, and I believe I entered into these gladiatorial arenas out of anger, one that I was under slash misrepresented, 
Two, that I was burned out on canonic literatures, primarily that of heterosexual white men. And three, I was taught that in order to climb the metaphoric ladder, I needed to run with the greats. I needed to best them in this literary arms race, tackle my voice into their cacophonous paranoid chorus and weave into the textures of a synthetic critical fabric. This is no way to write, let alone think, this lavish dinner table of consumption and regurgitation. My pain cannot just be merely aesthetic. Witness me, I survive still. Regarding paranoid reading, Sedgwick argues that by the mid 1980s, it became a privileged object of anti-homophobic theory during the height of the AIDS epidemic and has become a sort of paragon of queer thinking, albeit in theory, writing or reading. How did, and the insertions are mine here in the square brackets, how did paranoid reading spread so quickly from that status to being its uniquely sanctioned methodology? Part of the explanation lies in a property of paranoia itself, Cedric says. Simply put, paranoia tends to be contagious. More specifically, paranoia is drawn toward and tends to construct symmetrical relations, and in particular, symmetrical epistemologies or worldviews again. Us being attendants to, readers of, responding writers and actively embroiled in this current era of ecological and economic destruction, in the era of anti-drag rhetoric masquerading as transphobia and queer fatalism, in the era of the denouncement of critical race theory and gender affirming care in schools, in the era of residential school denialism, primi primarily the, the rhetoric around unmarked grays of our children in these places, we all aggravate daily upon the political and the policy work of paranoid reading. While Sedgwick is talking of paranoid reading in the form of the HIV slash AIDS epidemic and LGBTQ livelihoods in the 80s, she goes on to highlight the contours of paranoid reading at large. I want to bring this into our thinking about indigenous literatures as readers and writers of it and our audience's receptions of our stories by proxy. She argues, given that paranoia seems to have a peculiarly intimate relation to the phobic dynamics around homosexuality, then it may have been structurally inevitable that the reading practices that become most available and most fruitful in anti-homophobic work would often in turn have been paranoid ones. What this tells me from a paranoid reading model that is continually seeking out suspicion, that we are continually seeking out wrongdoing and error and conservatism is that they, the queer writers of the 70s to 90s, produced again and again paranoid writing models, specifically authored to those who denied their existence, to specifically again authored towards those who enforced death albeit slow or fast, upon their livelihoods. It becomes a closed circuit, call and response, a continual shouting match, a scrying, future anticipating form of criticism and reply to be doing paranoid reading and responding with paranoid writing of always looking for what is missing and responding in that sense. And what I think is a waste of world building energies via storytelling, at least in the now in 2023. I think the same here of indigenous literatures at large, and especially true of the stories indigenous queer or two spirit writers are participating in. That to be a paranoid reader who crafts paranoid writing in this call to arms, the war crying doom anthem of settler colonization and heteropatriarchy both within and without Indigenous communities, of normalized forms of self-destructive habits, we muddle our energies, we shrink, we emaciate. We leverage the work of sensing or approximating a future horizon of possibilities, all because we are so trained to scream back collectively, all, uh, all trained the challenging announcement of how dare you, the world we inhabit, one collectively dying through resource extraction, genocide, capitalism, patriarchal models, 
while we mourn a barren Lahaina, share with unhoused, oops, uh, share with unhoused indigenous members of Treaty 8 who flood into hotels in Alberta, while we breathe in the smoke of a decimated Shushua forest. The earth has no time to wait for paranoia. She cries for regeneration, repair in the now. We must be reparative readers and writers. We must call for literary and literal emancipation through the calling into being of animacy, which emerges through our joy, however untranslatable it may be to settler colonial ideologies. I'm just going to, this is a mix of critical and creative, I suppose. This is a, uh, my, my writing. Uh, September 6th, 2021. My uncle is struck by a car and dies instantly. June 15th, 2022. My last remaining maternal uncle is found dead on his bed. Both times I am in Toronto. Both times I am with a partner, albeit different ones. Both times I let mourning engulf me. I climb the CN Tower. Atop its needle, I light a cigarette. Emblazed, I pour across the city core dreams of wild tobacco and sweet smoke. Become an arrowhead. Knocked, I bow into the sky and pierce the heart of a thunderbird, which is not to say that I am deadly in my musings. I want to touch the thorax of God, nestle in her bone cage, sight creation in a thunderstorm, spill from caracol and divine rallies for these losses. I don't know if I've seen it all that often. What? That we've become our forebearers' dream. I suppose we're walking contradictions. And what beautiful metaphors we've become. I want to find beauty in the world and translate that into joyful storytelling. My published work up until this point in my life has become a eulogy for the dead. My epigraphs of violent graphing. Do you think your fathers are watching? That they weigh you in their ledger book? Against what? There is no book and your fathers are dead in the ground which comes from Cormac McCarthy's The Road. I am here again for my touring of book, uh, my book, Making Love with the Land, a materialized formulation of my mental warrings. I share story with audience. It appears that they have learned from this new story. And yet I am racked with anxiety. I am racked paranoically. Struggle to catch my breath, sweat on stage, pores too crying. A publication is meant to be celebratory and I lament. I find myself reading the road again. I write into the margins. Papa, do you hear me too? And boy, might I take a turn at fathering. I let Cormac McCarthy's you become me. Can you do it? When the time comes, when the time comes, there will be no time. Hold him in your arms just so the soul is quick. Pull him towards you, kiss him quickly. Such so I have already done it. I have split the skull of nation with a rock and found naught but a book to tax reconciliation and my name as deduction. Cormac is a catharsis to me. The abysmal grade book is enlightening. I want to know why. My body is a border between myself and the world, not a vehicle between them. That is the problem. What does literature mean to someone who is disbarred from his own storytelling histories? What does literature mean to one who is also disempowered in the formulations of its academic pedagogies? Daniel Heath Justice writes that indigenous literature, two powerful words in a powerful relationship, but not a neutral one, for some readers, these two words together are an oxymoron. For so long, indigenous literatures have been disallowed from the capital L of literature because they are seen as primitive or premature and or not yet developed enough to be experimental in form, genre, or aesthetics. And yet we are and have been forever storytelling in all forms as a means of proclaiming testifying and orating that we are, were, and will be here. Justice, quoting Robert Warrior, who's Osage, states that 
Nonfiction has been more than two centuries, a primary means through which indigenous people articulated their experiences of modernity. I wonder, is indigenous nonfiction both a means of archiving for indigenous peoples while also being a tchotchke for non-indigenous consumers? Yet this work I do to me is wholly an attempt to remove indigeneity from the prison house of the then in the past tense and release it into the now present tense. Indigenous storytelling deploys all genres and no genres simultaneously as it envelops past and present and future seamlessly. What does realism mean to indigenous literatures when what it regards as real our dreams, our trickster stories, our ancestors, our visions, anthropomorphism, little people, star people, wendigo, are disregarded as speculative or as fantastical by other readers or publishers and or academia. How can our stories become literature, assuming we even want this, under the colonial class and heteropatriarchal gatekeeping of form and genre? When I write of Masqua or Bear, and Nana Bush, a trickster, in Johnny Appleseed, this is most often read by non-Indigenous audience as a reinforcement of settler colonial ideologies of indigeneity, as flora and, and or as fauna, it's read as fantasy. I suppose I mean to ask, what is the use of realism in Indigenous literatures when its realities are misinterpreted as fodder or idyllic and or frontier fantasies? How does realism function for us when our lives and literatures are sharpened by paranoia? I'm back into my writing. I am eulogiac. I was first invited to Rideau Hall in 2016. I won the Governor General's History Award for my poem, Miku Guanyi, which means rose in cream. The sense is overloaded, like the heated Valerian knife of Rhaenyra Targaryen that foretells the song of ice and fire I too stood ablaze in glyph and syllabic. They tell me that I sound ancient when I speak to you of the Algonquin. Velvet, oak, teak, cartilage. What an exhibition to be enveloped within. There is a photo of my mother and I wearing the same velvet draped around the Baroque. Such profundity twisted up in the knots of our smiles. In another instance, a photo was taken in front of me in front of the portrait of Queen Elizabeth II, pageant of class, hands in a prayerful stance, I have come to bury my grandmother. Denied any history of their own, it was the fate of primitive peoples to be dropped out of the bottom of human history in order that they might serve representationally as its support, the point at which human history emerges from nature. Posited on this ledge of modernity and history, the Hall of Ottawa, a tomb of conquest, a curation of some story the nation tells itself to stratify, decadent and profane. I might dare you to entomb me, which isn't so much a dare as it is the truth of imperial ideology. Would my grandmother be carried with such ferocity and grace to her death chamber among her ancestors as Elizabeth was? who stood vigil at her autopsy table as she was murdered in Saskatoon. Find a bell jar to house the almonds of our amygdala. Shoot, he proclaims in bush and vigilante. Vosgeskewin might be the shot I take to gift the murdered a space of remembrance. It's important that we note a headstone is a luxury. Sedgwick names five types of paranoid reading forms, that paranoia is anticipatory, that it is reflexive and mimetic, that it's a strong theory, that it's a theory of negative affects or negative emotions, and finally, it places its faith in exposure. As a partner to paranoid reading, another form of analysis and being, she offers us reparative reading as a worldview or epistemology. Here she defines reparative reading as a highly personalized form of being, one that wants to assemble and confer plenitude on an object that will then have resources to offer an inchoate or one not fully formed self. 
This, as a methodology, she notes, is interested in elaboration on one hand and a deeply invested need to interpol interpolate the marginal and the fragmentary on the other. This, she notes, allows for rich possibilities, potentialities for surprise, which the paranoid reader is wholly against. They hate surprises and encourages openness where paranoid reading closes its shouting match or its circuit slash loop. Ultimately, what I call reparative writing embraces and enhances vulnerability. It requires the emotive. It is animated by our sensuality and it weaves the personal as political and the political as personal. You may note this in the popularization of autofiction, biotechs and or biopoetics in the now. Paranoid reading is always dismissive of reparative reading calling it incomplete, that reparative reading is emotionally invested and or interested. It's selfish, even. Sedgwick argues, the monopolistic program of paranoid knowledge systematically disallows any explicit recourse to reparative motives, no sooner to be articulated than subject to methodical uprooting. Reparative motives, once they become explicit, are inadmissible in paranoid theory because they are about pleasure, merely aesthetic. That paranoid reading is frankly ameliorative or merely reformist. What makes pleasure and amelioration so mere? Only the exclusiveness of paranoia's faith in demystifying exposure only its cruel and contemptuous assumption that the one thing lacking for global revolution or the explosion of gender roles or whatever is peoples, that is other peoples, having the painful effects of their oppression, poverty or deludedness sufficiently exacerbated to make the pain conscious as if otherwise it wouldn't have been and to make that pain tolerable as if intolerable situations were famous for generating excellent solutions, which comes from Sedgwick. How I read this in tandem with indigenous literatures in the era of the TRC or Truth and Reconciliation is through the popularization and the proliferation of residential school narratives in such a way as to disregard any other form of storytelling that isn't as confessional and or as voyeuristic into one's inundation with genocide as the residential school story often is. I see a lot of contemporary indigenous writers branching off into multi-genre and or multi-formal work, what Daniel Heath Justice calls wonderworking. So we have a minor chorus by Billy Ray Belcourt, Venko, Cherie Dimeline, and then she fell, Alicia Elliott, Bury My Heart at Chuck E. Cheese's, Tiffany Midge, Ilatsoe, Darcy Little Badger, but too often see it read, or these texts read as simple or as romantic as genre or pulp fiction, and thereby forcing these literatures to become exonerated from the curated ideology of what indigenous literatures is as defined by the publishing industry, what indigenous literatures can be, what indigenous literatures were, and in lieu of expectations that these indigenous literatures be educational or what you might know as commercial fiction versus literary fiction within the publishing industry. Because we forego paranoia, that is the work I'm trying to do, and I think the work this text, these texts are doing, that is that we don't abide by the paranoid reading of a colonial audience and so choose to not spotlight our trauma, our residential school, intergenerational pains, etc. In lieu of reparative reading slash writing, we too are usurped of our identifications, at least in the purview of Canadian publishing criticisms and readerships. We are usurped of our rightful place within Indigenous literatures. We are drained vampirically and stand in our mereness as storytellers on the margins of Indigenous oratory. <clears throat> Excuse me. To a paranoid settler colonial reader of Indigenous literatures, is to see our joy as withering, as insufficient, subjectless, and without recompense, due in part to the healing, or at least the removal of our pain as the primary motor of our stories. 
than such are art as red as macabre, as abject, as laced in the negative affectation or in the realm of the negative emotions. And because this, that is trauma and the residential school narrative, because in part of its popularity, sales, critical award acclaims, publicity, I can't not and, um, see too, uh, Michelle Good winning Canada Reads last year and becoming the text to read in Canada with Five Little Indians, that these have become a synecdoche, a synonym for Indigenous literatures, and by extension, peoples, that we are pedagogical, pathological, tautological, disembodied, taxidermized, taxidermized deterministic and curios of study only, that we are wounded beyond repair and are victims to our own tragic nostalgia, that there is no refuge in the paranoid function of living and being a colonized subject. I am elegiac. A black queer gives a land acknowledgement during Calgary Pride 2022. I think he gives more of a land claim in all honesty. I am guest to a Vogue ball inside the history of Black Queer NYC. The acknowledger orates, we thank Indigenous peoples for sacrificing themselves. I am standing in the background wearing a beaded red hand medallion and I dissipate outside of history. No power owns us. There is only the privilege of being with us. Stop trying to sound like a writer, Josh Amit. I am romanticized by it too all the time. Do we ever move out of our monogamy with animating death as our fueling desire? I guess for me, as I've noted for you, it's been in my refusal to dance with death and to want to find intimacy and joy and love beyond the maw of desire masquerading as serration. If we eat each other like alpha predators, then not much is left in my opinion. This is why I feel I cannot inherit the tragedy of settler gay history, why it disbars me from its holograms. Stonewall 1969 is my queer indigenous yesterday. I want my voice to reach back at least a week, if not more. There isn't much echoing being done these days. The forests are all clear cut. Silence hurts my ears. I find its presence in my proximity a harmful form of kinship. I am far too familiar with white noise in the quotidian, the everyday. I crave the sounds of song and croak. My electricity stops working for an evening. I call my dog into the bed. I rest my head near his. He places paw upon my head. Instinctively, he knows to pull me into his crook of leg and chest. The world is full of noise to him, this world and the fourth world. His heartbeat is a welcomed song, and I regress into a womb state. God, has anyone ever rested more holy than when we were children, in the backseat of a car at night, drifting off to the audible but imperceptible chatter of our parents' hushed voices? Furthering this ideology of paranoia as a strong theory, Sedgwick argues, in many ways, strong theories being made up of the illusion of loosely weak theories amalgamated in the topography of its encompassing stratosphere being, in big words, I'll explain. Such an arrangement is all to the good, suggestive, pleasurable, highly productive, an insistence that everything means one thing somehow permits a sharpened sense of all the ways there is of meaning it. But one not need read an infinite number of students and other critics' derivative rephrasing of a book's or an ideology's strong theory to see, as well, some limitations of this unarticulated relation between strong and weak theories. A strong theory, and as a locus of reflexive mimeticism, paranoia is nothing if not teachable. You might recognize the political and contemporary forms of strong theory in our everyday, make America great again, hashtag fuck Trudeau. And this is by no means a defense of his furthering entrenching settler colonialism on my part. Ideologies of wokeness, Islamophobia, transphobia, educational indoctrination, etc. Or vice versa, 
of the conservative ideologies that liberals too respond to and write from only their strong theories. Strong theory is exemplified as embodied knowledge, which forms embodied writing, rather than writing as a singular body, a body in communion, community, relations of constellations across time, or across human and non-human, across corporeal and non-corporeal, or the Cree tenant and the Cree law of Wogotuin, meaning all of my relations. The long-standing literary tradition of writing in a vacuum, of the author as the sole proprietor to story, or of suffering, re paranoia, as the animating motor of a story is outdated and colonial, and this is a belief of the contour of capital L literature as a strong theory that we, Indigenous writing, are responding to and from paranoia in its institutionalized ideologies, i.e. the publishing industries, rather than producing weak theory, or what is known as counter narratives that imagine otherwise, of not continually having to respond in this call and back fashion, as a methodology or form for future oriented oratories that are freeing and emancipatory. To focus only on indigenous literature as simply only writing of or from elements of the body as literature, as a strong theory or a primary um, ideology suggests, when equipped with methodologies of passage analysis, with editing processes and non-indigenous readerly inquisitions is to see it as either a simple aesthetic or poetic of idyllic romance or as deeply moving testimony that compels not but the already ingrained paranoid drive of see i told you they're sad and i paid my due for reconciliation through royalty and purchase in doing this you fail to see the bodily whole in its constellatory kinship structure that is you miss our extraneous joys further sedgwick notes that in the paranoid Freudian epistemology, it is implausible enough to suppose that truth could be even an accidental occasion of joy, inconceivable to imagine joy as a guarantor of truth. Indeed, from any point of view, it is circular to know that one's pleasure at knowing something could be taken as evidence of the truth of the knowledge. Both reparative and paranoid knowledge, reading and writing, are born out of a deep pessimism with the current state of being that is as continually subjugated peoples to set their colonization and imperial state sanctioned apparatus, capitalism, military policing, etc. Then can a literature strive towards emancipatory futurisms from the fraught bow of the now, if we are compelled to conduct our animating epistemologies through the alchemy of pessimism. Does pessimism lead towards nihilism? Inasmuch as its definition that all values are baseless and that nothing can be known or communicated. Nihilism, of course, being associated with extreme pessimism, a rogue form of knowing and being. Would a nihilistic pessimism brought about by paranoid reading allow for a more nuanced, culturally relevant and radically freed form of indigenous literary sovereignty? Would paranoid nihilism become a synecdoche for indigenous futurisms through decolonial revitalizations, such that what is baseless is English, the form and the modality of its colonial tenors, and what can be communicated is rather nihilistic to English's scalpels and lenses. Would we be the nihilist? Or would English continue its warpath of paranoid expectation through its strong theories that it would misrecognize us and our literatures as complacent subjects and instead contemplate our literatures as feral adversaries? How fatalism of the most egregious nihilistic paranoias, I'd wager. When indigenous literatures are translated back into the language of paranoid reading, that is Western colonial linguistic constellations, when we translate back into English, French, or Spanish, and their expectations of our oratories as synonyms or synecdoche for pain paranoically before they can be put to theoretical, creative, and or communal use taints our story's applicability because our literatures become a lens or a perch, an ivory tower, 
from which it peeks onto that horizon of settler colonialism, continually saying to itself, therefore, 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 instead of seeding the grounds for a potentiality of whereas, whereby, where to. Thereby, indigenous literatures unmoored from the colonial borders of generic boundaries and formulaic structures allow for us to inhibit a linguistic hinterland, a whereas, a where from, a wherefore to, that differentiates us from a settler temporal into Indian time, into being late to our own becoming and into indigenous oralities. We become untranslatable to the presumed knowability of settler colonial paranoia, or at large, what that might mean is colonialism and imperialism that allows for radical freedom and colonial emancipation in the form of joy that is spliced of its English tether and becomes unknowable and foreign, of a joy that is mercenary and riotous. As a paranoid two-spirit Oji Cree thinker and myself cowering from doom and apocalypse, I cannot express enough the ways in which Robin Maynard and Leanne Simpson's refrain from their book Rehearsals for Living that not all world endings are tragic has comforted me and continues to do so. In my observations around paranoid and reparative readings, thereby, at least in my practice, turning them to writings, it further comforts me that from my own knowledge bases, such as watching prairie fields alit, hazing Manitoban sky, the sun setting at 5 p.m., boundless fields masked in plume, husk and rapeseed burning with the light, and the fattening of hope seeding in the mirage caused by flame, heat bending light, its own cacophony, how light can sing, ground reflecting sky, air bent rivers, that something appears in the illusion, which is no illusion at all, but rather a mesmer, an opening, an influx of openings, collisions of worlds, kaleidoscopic otherness appears. And here I know newness is abound. There is no tragedy here, no genre, no form. There is but a hinterland of newness, and it's here where poetics are born, a slant and upside down, backwards facing freedom. Oh, I lost my space here. Sorry, here we go. And so I want to let go of this paranoia of which it turns into anger, release the monstrosity of hate and destruction of self and form I've crafted in my sternum. I'm returning to my opening remarks around Maria Campbell and her thanks for anger and writing. I don't think we need to come from a place of anger or paranoia anymore or to use it as our primary driving force in our creative endeavors. One, because to be locked in the closed circuit of call and response modes of criticism, continually howling at the partisan that separates our schools of thought is in my opinion, a waste of valuable energy and valuable craft. Worlds die that way. Two, our anger and paranoia reinforces a determinism that triangulates indigenous storyteller with indigenous story with indigenous community, such that what is often considered negative as a negative emotions as pain, rage, hate, envy become, allow us to become synonymous with that triangulation. And in doing so, reinforces a publishing landscape that actively seeks these stories out, that awards them, that popularizes them, that publicizes them. Which is not to say that these stories are not needed, but within the landscape of Canadian literature, the material production of these stories delimit how and when we can imagine otherwise in our stories. And three, that we must remember that we are guests to narrative, both within and outside of our literal and literary communities. And in doing so, like any good guest, we ought to come with a bottle of wine or dessert as reciprocal readers to the gifting that these stories give us, and in reciprocal fashion, to understand the cost it costs for the writer to write, that our narratives are not devoid of political 
are, are not devoid of politics because they are personal and vice versa and the required bloodletting and memory excavation to allow these literary beings to become. I shouldn't have to aestheticize my pain to make it visible, nor should I have to note that my pains are intolerable to the point of needing remedy. Here, your remedy in such a way as to brush myself deterministically as inevitable and invariably pained, as in need, as in needing saviorhood. This would infantilize me within the registers of settler colonization already warred to the nation state of Canada, warden over my own imprisonment, and I the guardian to this encavement of trauma. I have bitten stone, sat with the stone people. I've known stone angels. I've been stonewalled. All stones know a wailing song and can aggregate awake. I tire, I guess, of being the abyss that is stared at and stares back. This mereness is not emaciated. It is just that you have no word for that which you cannot know. Instead, you need to learn how to look upon its underside, the vortexing there, a portal into otherness, into other ways of reading, writing, being. The catacombs of language where key and mass have been so expertly hidden from us. Much like the injunction to be happy, as in Maria, write a happy book, is often a correlative for appeasement, a feigning of a toxic reciprocity. So too is the injunction for anger in our literary endeavors, which becomes an inferno to our health in all aspects of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual and a sluice gate to the salve that can grow words and worlds within us so that we might have those dreams and that tomorrow as Campbell orated in the beginning and jump through the portals to become whereas, whereby, where from, where to. Thank you. Hi, hi. Uh, let me just close this. Oh, there we go. I swear I've learned how to use Zoom. I just keep forgetting. <laughs> Honestly, same. I was also, I was I was so focused. I was like, oop, how do you use a computer? <laughs> <laughs> and I was using two at the same time. I was like, I feel like the girl with the dragon tattoo. <laughs> yeah, truly, I could never. Thank you so much, Joshua. That was amazing. I, I loved so much of it. I was scribbling down little notes as you wrote. Um, and I... I love that poetry can be a home for these kind of generative notions around wonder working. I loved that term so much, wonder working. It's so perfect. Um, so thank <laughs> you. Thank you so much for bringing that to us. Um, of course, my friends. Thank you all. And like, if you're interested in this, I know Prairie Fire will be publishing in the next issue. So you can see it in print. I know I'm very wordy. Um, brevity is not my forte, which is why I left poetry for a while. I might come back, but I have to like learn to rein it in. Right? <laughs> thank you all so much. Lots of love. Thank you. And yes, as, as Josh mentioned, um, it will be published in Prairie Fire in their winter issue, which um, comes out in January-ish um and um please do come back to poetry we love a long poem <laughs> <laughs> it'll be like the wasteland 2.0 i guess fantastic <laughs> great right beowulf yeah. like it's fine <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly amazing thank you so much and thank you so much to everyone for joining us tonight um this was such a blessing to um, have this on a Friday night. Thank you for spending your Friday evening or night with us. This is um, my preferred way of spending a Friday. So um, thinking and having feelings. So thank you very, very much. Um, and I will sign off with my now catchphrase, drink lots of water and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much, everybody.